Near the end of her life, Rebecca Harkness's dark secrets transformed her from an iconic beauty into a disturbing Frankenstein. Yet the tortured socialite ensured that her death was far more horrific. Rebecca Harkness was practically destined to become a spoiled little rich girl. Born in 1915 in St. Louis, Missouri, her father, Alan Tarwater, was a powerful stockbroker, while her mother, also named Rebecca, was a perfectly turned out trophy wife. The family looked immaculate from the outside. Behind closed doors, though, was another story. Little Betty had a horrific childhood. For one, her emotionally frigid parents wanted absolutely nothing to do with raising her. Instead, she was reared by a series of nannies, and they hired one nanny specifically because the woman had worked in an insane asylum before. Now, Rebecca's parents might not have cared about loving their daughter, but they definitely cared about what she looked like. When she was still just a young girl, they noticed that their Betty was putting on weight, so they signed the pudgy girl up for dance and figure skating lessons to help her shed those unsightly pounds. Rebecca started acting out early in her adolescence. While at her fancy finishing school, she didn't seem to care that her classmates were people with last names like Roosevelt. Instead, she scrawled in her scrapbook that she wanted to do everything bad. While at school, Harkness fell in with a fast crowd of like-minded women. That is, emotionally damaged drama queens looking to get revenge on their parents. If that sounds like a recipe for disaster, it really was. They dubbed themselves the Bitch Pack and, after graduating in 1932, set about trying to wreak havoc on the socialite scene, one gala at a time. The most famous pack story from around this time is when, during one particularly boring and respectable soiree, the group decided to spike a punch bowl with laxatives. Did I mention Rebecca pulled this prank at her own sister's debutante ball? The pack also got very rowdy at these gatherings. At least once, Rebecca and her friends got up on a banquet table and performed a risque dance for the distinguished guests around them. At one point, Rebecca's antics were so extreme they got her kicked off a cruise ship. Styling herself as the life of the party, Rebecca did things like throw plates at the ship's Filipino orchestra, swim in her birthday suit in full view of other passengers, and send out strings of swears so loudly that the ocean liner eventually had no choice but to send the beautiful, foul-mouthed socialite off the boat. When Rebecca was 24 years old, she decided it was high time to marry, and she chose Dixon W. Pierce, an upper-class photographer, as her first husband. Pierce was the descendant of Franklin Pierce, the 14th president of the United States, and seemed like a good match for the ambitious girl. Socialite circles are infamously tight-lipped about their marriages, but there's almost no doubt that Rebecca's union with Pierce was a dismal affair. Rebecca divorced Pierce in 1946 after an excruciating seven-year marriage. And it wasn't long before she set her sights on William Hale Harkness, the heir to the Standard Oil fortune. If you hear oil and think Russian oligarch rich, you'd be pretty much right. William was rolling in money, which made him the perfect candidate for Rebecca's expensive tastes. Still, and my grandfather loved saying this, when you marry for money, you earn every penny. Although William Harkness came from a well-respected family that was supposed to give Rebecca even more of the status she craved, William himself was a total fool. The New York Times described him as an embarrassing sort of man, and his hobbies completely back this up. For example, he liked to vanity publish nonsensical books that even he admitted were awful. But friends who knew Rebecca and William said that although the oil tycoon was a bit of an idiot, the new Mrs. Harkness was actually scared of him. And for good reason. William, 15 years her senior, saw Rebecca as a naughty child in need of spanking. Much of their marriage dynamic was about his domineering presence setting her on the straight and narrow. Now, we know Rebecca had always been well off as a child, as you might guess from the string of nannies who raised her. But marrying William Harkness thrust her into an entirely different tier of society. By 1956, she'd even snagged a photo spread in vogue. 
Rebecca had already had two children with her first husband, Alan and Anne Terry Pierce, and she then had one more child with William, a daughter named Edith. Unfortunately, Rebecca's mothering instincts left something to be desired. When Rebecca decided to renovate her Rhode Island mansion, she demanded that it have a whopping eight kitchens and 21 baths. Reportedly, she wanted these updates so that she could see as little of her children as possible. All the extra rooms would give the nannies plenty of space to feed and bathe the babies without Rebecca having to know a thing about it. In 1954, something curious happened to Rebecca Harkness. Her oil tycoon husband died. Suddenly, Rebecca was a rich widow, one of the wealthiest women in America, in fact. She had a newfound freedom to do whatever she wanted with the piles of money in her bank account. So what did she do? The question here is, what didn't she do? Rebecca turned into one of the most tasteless, gaudy eccentrics the Western Hemisphere had ever seen. And I say that with some admiration. Her parties, always extravagant, now grew bizarre. With Harkness trying out new things like dyeing her chocolate mousse blue before serving it to guests, or, in yet another notorious act, dyeing a cat green. Some say it was a dog. One of Harkness's signature moves was to use vastly expensive products for everyday mundane things. She loved to pour Dom Perignon into her pool and let guests swim around in the bubbly. She would also fill her fish tanks with scotch, even as living goldfish swam in them. In the art world, the shade International Klein Blue is famous and was custom mixed by renowned artist Eve Klein in 1960. Well, Rebecca Harkness was not to be outdone by anyone and she commissioned her own Harkness Blue, which she used to upholster the velvet Louis XIV-style chairs she had placed in her studio. Her descent into unreality went further. In 1961, Harkness decided she wanted to become the next great ballet master. So she sponsored actual master Robert Joffrey's artisanal ballet troupe. Yet while there... Harkness gave new meaning to the word prima donna. The socialite, now fancying herself a dance expert, started writing her own ballets. When Joffrey refused to perform the schlock and wouldn't rename the ballet in her honor, she all but fired him from his own company, then twisted the knife in by taking most of his dancers with her to form her new solo Harkness ballet. Without any real studio space, her dancers often practiced on her front lawn, where she installed a blue geodesic dome as a formal practice space. Her wealthy neighbors had other ideas and scornfully forced her to remove the unsightly object. When publicizing her ballet, she became notorious for refusing to showcase any of her talented dancers in the promotional photographs. Instead, she put herself front and center. Even so, there was one brilliant choreographer, Larry Rhodes, who received good press, and reviewers agreed he was one of the company's only shining lights. However, Harkness couldn't bear to be upstaged, so she unceremoniously fired Rhodes as well. This vicious side was matched by a endearing eccentric side. She would pay for her dancer's nose jobs at the drop of a hat and buy office desks for her administrators that cost months worth of New York rent. One of her administrators also described how Harkness would come to the office in pink and blue leotards, literally stand on her head, and demand to have serious conversations while she performed her acrobatic work. If Harkness's lovers are anything to go by, she was also a wildcat in the bedroom. One of her conquests, producer Bertrand Castelli, described one rendezvous they had in her office as like two camels in the desert who suddenly know that the only way to make an oasis is to really talk sense. This actually doesn't make sense, which probably means it was a pretty wild night. Harkness also liked to reward her boy toys, and she soon made Castelli the artistic director of her ballet company. While he was under her employ, she would often order him around romantically. She once demanded Castelli to kiss me. The others, they just know how to bite. Around this time, Harkness fancied herself a composer as well, and would often perform her original songs to polite reception at famed places like Carnegie Hall. As her own biographer put it, 
The only reason her works were ever played in public was because she subsidized the performances. Harsh, but true. Equipped with this impressive self-confidence, Rebecca thought that the infamously reclusive writer J.D. Salinger had the perfect stories for her music. So one day, she disguised herself as a cleaning lady, knocked on his door, and then tried to convince him to let her use his fiction. He was not convinced. In 1961, Harkness gave True Love another shot, marrying prominent celebrity doctor Benjamin Harrison Keene. Yet, like so much of Harkness's life, what seemed beautiful on the outside was rotting on the inside. Though Keene consulted with multiple U.S. presidents, he also had big-time mafia ties. Unfortunately, the pair made it only four years before divorcing. And then Rebecca's life began to turn from scandalous to tragic. Just after 1966, Harkness became a grandmother when her daughter Terry gave birth to a little girl. The baby, named Angel, was severely brain damaged. Nonetheless, Harkness actually doted on the babe. And for a time, it seemed like she was going to be a better grandmother than she was a mother. For a time. Harkness's adoration for her grandchild vanished almost overnight. Reportedly, the baby Angel innocently pulled a ribbon from Harkness's perfectly coiffed hair. And with that, Rebecca's love evaporated. By this time, the dysfunction in Rebecca's family was palpable. Rebecca's daughter Edith was clinically depressed for much of her life and spent scores of years in and out of mental institutions following near-fatal attempts at self-harm. The most tragic detail? Rebecca was anything but empathetic. Faced with Edith's grim drive, Harkness was only coldly philosophical. How should she do it, she wondered. Is there a chic way to go? One day, Rebecca would find that question out for herself. Meanwhile, her son Alan went to prison after killing a man in a fight, and he called the years he spent there and away from his mother the happiest of his life. In 1974, Harkness married again, this time to another doctor named Niels H. Lowerson. She hoped that the fourth time would be the charm, but the socialite had no such luck. The couple divorced in 1977. It was the end of other things, too. One of Harkness's final acts in her role as ballet maestro was also her most embarrassing. She shoved five million into building the Harkness Theater, a lavish studio complete with marble staircases and a chandelier. But for all her money, Harkness did not have good taste. She was famous along the eastern seaboard for her tacky, campy, new money sensibilities, and her Harkness Theater was the epitome of her gaudy aesthetic. While a kinder critic likened it to a lavish ladies' powder room, less generous experts compared it to a Staten Island beauty parlor. And in the end, the Harkness Theater and her ballet were all for nothing. The company collapsed in 1975. Rebecca had always loved to be surrounded by the wrong people, people who were hangers-on. Her son Alan once described the blackmailing lawyers, the weirdos, the people in the trances that she hung out with. Even worse, Rebecca liked to keep her circle in competition with each other, with each one of her lackeys vying to become the favorite. In the 1960s, Harkness took on Bobby Seavers, a dancer who was 25 years her junior, as her lover. Now, a grown woman can do whatever she wants in her own bed. But this was a strange choice, and not because of the age gap. Seavers was a self-identified gay man, and couldn't have been in the relationship for romance. They also brought out the worst in each other. Besides despising Rebecca's children, Bobby also hated her disabled granddaughter Angel. When Harkness planned to put Angel's nursery over top of his room, Bobby snapped, Let the little creature die. Yet, he was one of the few people still by Harkness' side when the end came. As she aged, Rebecca couldn't bear to face her mortality or the loss of her youth. She started to live off champagne and injections, including testosterone and an assortment of pain medications. 
In particular, Rebecca took the testosterone injections to strengthen her body for dance. But the medicine actually had the opposite effect. Because of her abused muscles and her extravagant dependence on the testosterone, Harkness actually began to lose her dancer's elegance. Near the end of her life, one friend noted that she walked like Frankenstein. People also reported that Rebecca's lavish marble bathrooms were often splattered with blood and that her muscles had begun to calcify. By 1980, many of Rebecca's old friends had dropped off and she was left with only her most sycophantic hangers on. Her body had been slowly falling into disrepair. Again, those injections hurt far more than they helped and she started complaining of a mysterious stomach ailment. That's when doctors told Rebecca that she had one illness no amount of money or injections could cure. She was dying of stomach cancer. From now on, no matter what she did or who she tried to pay off, the last great American heiress had a terrifyingly short and brutal time to live. Though her children, Edith and Terry, rushed to her bedside, along with her lover, Bobby, the scene was anything but heartwarming. According to Bobby, it was complete chaos. Everybody running around, signing wills, and trying on different wigs. And when Rebecca actually died on June 17, 1982, it got stranger. Rebecca Harkness had to do everything in her own particular style, even when it came to moving on to the next life. Before she passed, the socialite spent $250,000 to commission a bedazzled urn from none other than Salvador Dali. Ironically nicknamed the Chalice of Life, the morbid monument stood right at the intersection between tacky and lavish, just like Rebecca herself. It even spun on its base so that Rebecca could always be dancing beyond the grave. The only thing was, Harkness's designer urn was far too small for her actual remains. As Rebecca's friend once said, just a leg is in there, or maybe half of her head and an arm. So instead of giving her mother a dignified end, Rebecca's daughter Terry had to carry the rest of her ashes home, bound up loosely in a humble supermarket bag. In recent years, Rebecca Harkness has gained new fame, or infamy, because of her connection to Taylor Swift. Swift bought Harkness's Rhode Island Manor, which she named Holiday House in 2013, and used the estate to throw her own lavish parties, notably her Taymerica July 4th bashes. Swift then penned the song The Last Great American Dynasty, which tells part of Harkness's magnetic story to the world. But as this video shows, there's so much that can't be encapsulated in a song, especially the coda to Rebecca Harkness's life. Not long after her death, Rebecca's daughter Edith finally managed to succeed in her attempts. Perhaps most tragically, Rebecca's little granddaughter Angel had passed just before Rebecca herself. She was just 10 years old. The last great American dynasty, indeed. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating facts throughout history.